say goodbye to your credit card rewards. Greedy corporate mega stores, led by Walmart and Target, are pushing for a law in Congress to take away your hard-earned cash back and travel points to line their pockets. The Durbin Marshall Credit Card Bill would enact harmful credit card routing mandates that would end credit card rewards as we know it. If you love your credit card rewards, tell your lawmakers, hands off my rewards. Tell them to oppose the Durbin Marshall Credit Card Bill. A science story, huh? These NYU scientists, they I it felt, felt I really right. Felt. I was so and I just thought, well, I had figured it, out. it was that golden moment. Because science was on my side. Hey everyone, I'm Ben Lilly, and welcome to the Story Collider, where we bring you true personal stories about science. This week's story is from Tara Legu. It was recorded in April 2015 at Design Exchange in Toronto, Ontario, as part of the Springer Storyteller series. So, in the gay community, there's this kind of popular idea. The idea of a root. That is the root cause of your homosexuality. This never actually really appealed to me because I was pretty clear early on that the root cause of my homosexuality had something to do with the popularity of terry cloth short sets in the 1980s and a haircut called the Dorothy Hamill. But when I started thinking about telling my life in science story, the idea of a root was really compelling to me. Because when asked what I do, I say, well, I I like to ask interesting questions and at the same time try to address some injustice. But that's really not where I started. And when I started thinking about where I started, I remembered that my start in science was a vow. A vow to beat Paige Hogan, science fair champion. (laughs) Now, I went to elementary school with Paige Hogan, and Paige was pretty and blonde and super nice and popular and named Paige Hogan. And for the record, Paige Hogan is a way better grade school name than Tara Lagoo. (laughs) And every year, Paige beat me in the science fair. I mean, every year. In fourth grade, she, she got first place, beating out my Halley's Comet simulation. Her project was called, Can Cheese Be Made at Home? I thought, I'll get her. In fifth grade, I designed a complicated randomized controlled trial of artificial sweeteners versus sugar. I enrolled my entire class as participants, but there was no informed consent. Please do not tell our IRB. Um, And I thought I would win, but Paige beat me again and got first prize with her project, Can a Camera Be Made at Home? (laughs) I was was plotting my sixth grade revenge, a uniquely titled project called Can Yogurt Be Made at Home? when (laughs) When I got the good news, Paige had made the sixth grade cheerleading squad. It totally took off her science edge. Her last science fair project was her seventh grade project on irradiation of beans, and she got only a participation ribbon. So the field was wide open. (laughs) And I don't know why, but it took me until ninth grade to finally win first prize. And that year, I won with a project called Mutant Drosophila. If you don't know what Drosophila are, they are fruit flies. And I had the idea that I would put their eggs in my parents' microwave and see if their descendants were mutants. I I know. For years, you could not pick up a banana off of my mother's counter that like a swarm of mutant fruit flies wouldn't come out of it. But it actually worked, because I did win first prize. And also, it was different than anything I had ever done in school. And by the end of it, I was pretty sure I was gonna be a scientist. 
I lived in Indiana, so I did what every kid in Indiana who wanted to be a scientist did. I applied to Purdue University, and I got into the pharmacy program, and I got into a special program called Freshman Scholars, where I was going to go right into the lab, because I wanted to be a scientist, and if you're a scientist, you work in a lab, right? But when I got to the lab, I learned a terrible truth. The first 15 years or so you work in a lab consist only of pipetting. So if you don't know what pipetting is, pipetting is the process of removing a small amount of container, from, a small amount of liquid from one container into another, back and forth. It may or may not involve other things, sterility, a fume hood, unattractive protective eyewear, but regardless, I was looking at 15 years of pipetting, and frankly, I was longing for the days of, can cheese be made at home? And there was another problem, too, and that was that I had realized that there was a lot of injustice in the world. And it wasn't just, like, kind of out there. It was actually happening to me and my friends. My freshman year, my RA broke into my room in the middle of the night to reveal to the residents of my dorm, I guess, and prove that my girlfriend and I slept in the same bed. It was, a, like, a public shaming thing. And then... My second year, a friend of mine was beaten up in a restaurant while people yelled racist and homophobic things at him. Um, and to add insult to injury, the restaurant's logo was burritos as big as your head. And then there was the fact that I decided to move off campus and turn my apartment into a big gay party house, because, right, that's what you should do. But that was kind of subdued when the fraternity next door spray-painted kill the fags on the wall of our apartment building. So I really needed to quit the lab because I had to change the world. And I joined the student government. I tried to get elected other people who shared my passions. I ran a campus leadership conference on diversity. I testified at the city council when there was a, a measure up that proposed that discrimination should be legal against gay people. Interestingly, that did not pass at the time, which is proof that Indiana has changed since then, although I don't know in which direction. But anyway, I, I had done all this, I was empowered, and I simultaneously was realizing in my work as a student pharmacist that I was good at connecting with patients, and that maybe I should just go to med school. So I went to med school and then residency, foolishly thinking that it would allow me to fulfill my idealistic visions. But I was pretty disturbed by the randomness and sometimes brutality of our healthcare system. There was this moment when I was a resident, I had this patient who was uninsured, and she had cancer, and she had delayed care and ended up dying in an ambulance on the way to a hospital that had promised her free chemotherapy. I just, I was worried I was gonna burn out. I loved my patients and I was challenged, but I didn't think that I was really making a difference. Lucky for me, I found the Robert Wood Johnson Clinical Scholars Program, which is a fellowship program. It's now been it's now ending, but at the time, it trained healthcare leaders and researchers to do the exact kind of work that I wanted to do. I tried to put all my passions into my application and really tell them what I wanted to do with my life. I don't know how well it worked, though, because when I was at the University of Pennsylvania interviewing, I was standing outside the office of my soon-to-be program director, and let me just say, they told me to stand in the hall, and her door was open. But I heard her, Katrina Armstrong, I heard her talking to the person who had interviewed me before, a woman named Judith Long, who's a really great person as well. And Katrina said to Judith, so, so what, is this, what does this Tara Lagoo want to do? And Judith said, I, I, I don't know, if she was a pharmacist, I'm not sure, she was a pharmacist. Uh, and there was like this pause. And Katrina said to Judith, we only want people here who want to do research that really matters. I was in the hall, and I heard this, and frankly, I was panicking. 
of course I want to do research that matters, I thought. I mean, of course I want to do that. But I can't just say I want to do research that matters. I really need to come up with something and fast. And I'm standing there and my entire personal and scientific biography is flashing through my head. Paige Hogan, mutant drosophila, pipetting, the downtrodden gaze of Indiana, the Lafayette City Council residency, my uninsured patients who couldn't get the care they need. And I walked into the interview and Katrina said, so why do you want to be in this program? And I looked at her and I said, I want to be in this program because I am passionate about social justice. So I, I knew where I was going, but I just had to get there. A few years later, I was seeing a patient and she needed to see a urologist. And she had two very attentive daughters and I couldn't figure out why she had not yet seen a urologist. And I said, you know, your mom really needs to see a urologist. What's going on? And the daughter said, we'd love to take her to see a urologist, but we can't find one who will see a patient who uses a wheelchair. And I said, what are you doing? Of course, of course doctors see patients who use wheelchairs. I said, I'm the doctor. I'll make some calls. But, but when I made the calls, I found out that, in fact, I couldn't find a doctor who would see a patient who used a wheelchair. They would see her if she came in an ambulance and had EMTs transfer her to an exam table, but I couldn't, see, couldn't find anyone who would see her and transfer her themselves, and she couldn't afford an ambulance. And so I went back into the room to tell the patient's daughter, and she said, Doctor, it's like discrimination or something. So I realized this is probably a systemic problem and we should probably study it. And so with some medical students and residents, we called subspecialty practices across the United States and asked them if they would see a patient who used a wheelchair. And what we found was shocking. 20% of subspecialists refused to see a patient in a wheelchair. And of the rest, half had, would see a patient but had plans to transfer that patient in ways that are considered to be unsafe. There is a US law that mandates that patients with disabilities have access to care, but most of the patients that we were seeing who use wheelchairs were getting substandard care. So this is just the beginning. I, I mean, I have a long way to go. I've defined a tiny little piece of the problem. And of course, there's a lot to be done to fix the problem. But it's worth noting that in that moment, my entire history, my experience of being a young gay science fair nerd, my life experiencing injustice and discrimination in Indiana, my clinical experiences and my training as a researcher came together. And I saw an injustice, I knew how to study it, and now, I can work to make it better. Thanks. That was Tara Legu. Tara is an academic hospitalist in the Center for Quality of Care Research and Department of Medicine at Bay State Medical Center and an assistant professor at the Tufts University School of Medicine. She was a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation clinical scholar at the University of Pennsylvania, where she developed her research interests in the quality of health care in the United States. Currently, her work is focused on improving quality and reducing costs of health care in the United States, and in particular, improving access to care for patients with disabilities. She spends much of her free time thinking about, growing, talking about, taking pictures of, and eating heirloom tomatoes. This story was produced with Springer Science and Business Media as part of the Springer Storyteller series, featuring real-life stories from researchers on the front lines of discovery. See and hear more at beforetheabstract.com. The Story Collider is produced by me, Brian Wecht, Aaron Barker, Ari Daniel, Christine Gentry, Skylar Bear, and Liz Neely. The podcast is produced by Rose Eveleth. Additional help from Brooke Williams, Lana Groger, and Justin D'Ambrosio. The theme music is by Ghost. Special thanks to Design Exchange for hosting the show, to everyone at Springer for being amazing partners, to our Patreon supporters for their continued support, and to the Supreme Court of the United States of America. Thanks for listening.
When it comes to weight loss, no two people are the same. That's why Noom builds personalized plans based on your unique psychology and biology. Take Brittany. After years of unsustainable diets, Noom helped her lose 20 pounds and keep it off. I was definitely in a yo-yo cycle for years of just losing weight, gaining weight, and it was exhausting. And Stephanie. She's a former D1 athlete who knew she couldn't out-train her diet, and she lost 38 pounds. My relationship to food before Noom was never consistent. And Evan, he can't stand salads, but he still lost 50 pounds with Noom. I never really was a salad guy. That's just not who I am. Even through the pickiness, Noom taught me that building better habits builds a healthier lifestyle. I'm not doing this to get to a number. I'm doing this to feel better. Get your personalized plan today at Noom.com. Real Noom users compensated to provide their story. In four weeks, a typical Noom user can expect to lose one to two pounds per week. Individual results may vary.